Welcome, this is David Bogey with Grace Ann Rosil, and today we're going to feature Leslie Marmon Silco. And she's a wonderful storyteller, and we begin our series on storytelling. And I'm here with Grace Ann Rosil, who's doing the drumming. You can see her now in the picture. And the credits are that I, I'm narrating and I wrote the script. And Grace Ann's the drummer and the director for the series. So thank you very much for being here. We're going to look at four authors, uh, writers, presenters. Leslie Marmo Silco, who's written a number of things we'll look at. But today we'll focus on this, her uh, work on The Storyteller. It's called The Storyteller. And we'll look at Gertrude Stein and her work in 1935 uh, on narrative. And I'll get us out of the way so you can see it. And Walter Benjamin, a year later, wrote a very classic essay in Europe. And I think it's one of the best essays I've written. You can find it on Google and just say Walter Benjamin, Storyteller, PDF. And then Grace Ann Rosil, who's sitting next to me doing the drumming, we're going to feature her at the end of the video today and in the pictures uh, you see at the end of the video and some of her films today. And she's going to ask me questions from time to time to make this a wonderful presentation for you all. But today we're focused on Leslie Marmo Silco. And I'm going to do some po what's called poetic storytelling. So that's why we have the, the drumming. And I think what we're trying to get out of this today is um, the connection of my family background, my ancestors with indigenous racism, colonialism, and they're kind of on both sides of the fence on that, on both sides of my family tree. And Leslie Mormon Silco's work in that direction, because she's known for that as a theme. So just to summarize some of the work that she's done, which is all amazing, uh, the book Laguna Woman Poems, 1974, Ceremony, 1977, the storyteller we feature today was 1981, a book with James Wright called With the Delicacy and Strength of Lace, 1985, a book by herself again, Almanac of the Dead, a novel, 1991. And finally, Yellow Woman and a Beauty of the Spirit, Essays of Native American Life Today. And that's what our film is about today, is Native American life today and Native American life as it was in my family history. Now, Leslie Silco, you know your history, so you don't know me. And I'm sharing some of my history today to help you get to know me better. And maybe someday you'll be on this show together with Grace Ann and myself. That's the purpose. So here we go. Uh, this is my family tree. On uh, my mother's side, you'll see my, my mother's name is Lorraine Joyce. And it's a picture from 1948. She's holding me in uh, a blanket. And in the center there, the picture on the left, is Wilda. I always call her Wild A. She's my grandmother. She's the one I trust most of my ancestors. And then there's Percy Brown, who was in Native American schools, those kind of oppressive schools that Leslie Silco, you talk about in your book. And he bailed out the window, jumped out the window to go fishing, and never went back. But he was raised by a number of tribes in Washington State and pretty much stayed there the rest of his life. And so we want to talk about him. In fact, it's kind of an interesting story. I hope you'll find it interesting because his brother, his mother, uh, took him to California and put the Percy Brown in the Indian school and never looked back. And the brother led that wealth of white privilege and Percy Brown led a whole other life. On the other photo on the right is a gathering in Spokane, Washington 
um, the little baby being held on the right, sort of right center. And far right is Dennis Boji, who's a merchant marine, hardly ever came home. And notice he stands apart from the family. Then is August Boji, shorter in the suspenders. He's the patriarch of the family. Uh, and next to him, slightly behind him, is my dad, Daniel Quinton Boji, holding me. And I'm a little bit older in this photo, maybe a year, year and a half. And next to him, that beautiful looking woman is my mother, uh, Lorraine Joyce again. And behind her is Rose. And then my grandmother, uh, who has some wonderful stories that I collected. I want to tell you another time. And then on the left, far left is Dennis and his wife, Dorothy. I've written about Dorothy because she committed suicide or allegedly didn't. And that family, our family has been really split up over this ever since, but they're the three children of, of Vernon, who was a deputy sheriff, a jailer in Spokane. And he actually jailed me from time to time when I was a teenager. Uh, so what I want you to notice about this photo on the right, and I actually wrote it here so you could get a sense of it, is Edward Boji was the brother of August Boji. And August, the patriarch of the family, scratched out his name from the Bible. August Boji's name was removed. That's where you keep the births and the deaths and the births and the marriages, etc. And nobody spoke about him. I was 53 years old. I'm now 75 before my mother, Lorraine Joyce, actually told me his name. <laughs> you know, Edward. I'd never heard of Edward. Nobody had ever said the word Edward Boji. And we're going to look at that story. But first, let's look a little bit into uh, my mother's side of the family and crossing the United States in a covered wagon. First of the Chisholm Trail, they picked it up. Uh, this is a map from 1873. And here you see the Oregon Trail and as it's depicted in oftentimes with the buffalo that no longer roam, right? Leslie Silco would testify to that, except for Yellowstone. Anyway, uh, they crossed this um, trail at a time when the railroad was already in place. In fact, the railroad had been there for about 20 years, 40 years, actually. Uh, between that time, my dog is barking in the background, and that's okay, because that's what dogs do, and we're a family with people and dogs. Now, the reason they didn't take the train is they were poor bogies. They couldn't take the train because they didn't have the money for the train. So that's why they went across in a covered wagon. And the story, we catch the story there, and... Leslie Silco, your story touched my story, and my stories are a reaction to your story. And on the Oregon Trail, you know, that's a thousand, two thousand miles. It's a journey of four to six months, and it takes a while to get, a, get a, across that Oregon Trail, get to the other side, and uh, they were headed probably for Oregon but we'll see that they had to stop and they gave it up in Goldendale, Washington. Now, born in 1902 in Lucas, Iowa, is that grandmother Wilda, the ancestor I trust the most and I turn to for my advice even now. She's departed, but I still turn to her for advice. And there was a little baby named Henry Wayne Shelton. This was the Shelton family crossing. On the Oregon Trail. And so I figure my, my grandmother would have been about five years old doing that crossing, uh, maybe starting at age three to age five. Uh, but Henry Welt, Wayne Shelton died in just under a year and was buried somewhere. This is Wilda as a young woman, truly beautiful young woman. 
And we want to tell a little bit about her stories because I think it parallels Leslie Silko, some of the things in your book. But let's get a little background here. Now, they came west wanting to be farmers. And here they, they have a farm but and a couple of horses and a plow. But they're not really farming because it didn't work out. Uh, they end up going into town and and the elder patriarch, William Henry Shelton, opened a blacksmith shop. You can see him right behind the horses with a pipe in his mouth. Uh, Wilda and her parents, Virginia Tuttle Shelton and William Henry Shelton. Far left is Ray Eaton, who would marry Wilda, my grandmother. And Wilda had a brother named Gerald. So Wilda's brother is the focus of the story I want to get to here. Now, Gerald married a princess, Native American princess, we found out. I found out at age 53, didn't know it till, till then in my life, because it wasn't spoken about. It's forbidden. It was taboo. But Gerald Shelton married a woman named Stella LeClaire, and they had a baby named Georgia, or Georgie. We have two photographs of her. On the right, in a papoose, in front of an old model car. And on the left, she's maybe 10, 12 years old as a horse. So she would, she grew up with my grandmother and Stella LeClaire lived together in a house in the woods in Washington State. And the story I wanted to tell you is that Gerald Shelton, here with the horse in front of the livery stable that the Shelton family owned in the city of Goldendale, he was beaten to death in a nearby little village called Topinish, in the Topinish jail. His sheriff, a deputy sheriff, allegedly beat him to death. And they say he was a drunk. I don't know if that's true or not true. I do know that uh, Wilda and her brother, Gerald, were rodeo riders in the rodeo. You can't be drunk all the time if you're rodeo riders. But they had a daughter, and I think times were tough, and uh, prejudice was high. And anyway, he was killed. Here's a little map to show you where Topinish is and where I was born in Spokane. So you get a sense of geography here. And Goldendale would be just south of where the Topinish Green Star is. Now let's fast forward to Wilda, much older. Percy Brown, her second husband now, after Ray Eaton. And it's 1951, Christmas party. Now, I always thought that Percy Brown was kind of gruff. He's the fellow that jumped out of the window in the third grade, went fishing and never came back. And, uh, you know, he, he and Wilda, when they were younger, were forest rangers and lived outdoors, always fishing, hunting, taking care of the wilderness, wonderful ethics. But as he got older, he got cancer, and he was kind of gruff with people. And I remember... Here, I didn't know he had cancer, and I didn't know why he would be gruff. He's telling me, don't open the presents, David. Don't open the presents, David. And I'm sitting there wanting to open my present. Now, my, my mother, Lorraine uh, Joyce, she went to a school called Cleellum, and in the center there, you see Cleellum Dash Roslyn. That's because there's two schools uh, in two different towns, so about three and a half miles apart, decided that the only way they were going to end the rivalry, and it's a rivalry that goes back to the very beginning of these two high schools, was to create a new school sort of partway between the two schools and the two towns. My mother played basketball for that school uh, called Cleellum High School. Now, she also played volleyball. She was a very athletic woman. And this was a dangerous sport in those days. Uh, 
women would have knockdown fights and uh, pull each other's hair, pull themselves to the ground. And some of the women, uh, these were coal towns and the coal industry was winding down. And uh, some of the women wore razor blades to protect themselves. Uh, so this was, bumping around and getting punched was part of the game. This, these were rough people, <laughs> you know. <laughs> On the right is kind of a dreamy look at Veronica Lake. And people often said that uh, my mother looked like Veronica, Veronica Lake. Now, she didn't have the blonde hair, okay? But she did uh, put her hair up and curl it. And uh, the people in the high school used to call her the blonde bomber. Again, no blonde hair, but that's the way it was. It's a picture of Cleelum High School built back in the day. And I got to think that more indigenous people were there 1907 to 1912 when that school was built. It's Cleelum is named uh, after the Kitatas tribes word. Cleelum means swift water. And I know that Leslie Stokoe, you were doing a lot of writing in your book about the waters, the rivers, and I appreciate the book for that. I'm trying to share my background. Here's a little close-up of the school, get a sense of the children there. Perhaps they're indigenous or not. We don't know. I can't find any history of it. It just seems to be the history that's untold. Uh, now, Lorraine Joyce, stepfather, father was Percy. Clarence Brown, and her stepsister was named Val, or Val for short. I always called her Aunt Val. And uh, they he started a sibling rivalry between the two of them that lasted the rest of both their lives. And uh, eventually they had trailers next to each other in Washington State, even though they feuded daily with each other. And I would visit both of them when I could. So I'll give you a little bit of background here and uh, just wanted to show you I'm not making it up. You know, this is the, the history I've been able to, to gather. And Mama Val said, he always said, Ix kupa wupachi. And it drove him crazy. The Klielum tribe is who raised him after he escaped. And he, he uh, had a motorcycle, and he he's, uh, fished and hunt in the old indigenous ways. Who are you speaking of here? Oh, my, my, my step-grandfather, Percy. Okay. And, uh, and my dad tells me a story of Percy Brown that uh, after he was a forest ranger with my grandmother, Wilda, he drove dump trucks in the desert in the deep desert valley. And he would crank up the heat early in the morning, 6 a.m., and have layers of clothes on, jacket upon jacket, and then there was no air conditioning in dump trucks those days, and then take off the uh, jackets as he went. I mean, this was an outdoors man, and even as a dump truck man, <laughs> he, was a, he, he was a scary dude, okay? And uh, my cousin... Renee told me these stories, and I give her credit for that. So this was the, the picture of Cleelum High School, sort of between 1941 and 1944, when my mother went there. To me, it looks very, very institutional, you know. And this gives you a little bit of a picture of uh, Cleelum, and uh, then Roslyn would have been a little north west of it, about three and a half miles. And that's where the rivalry between the two high schools. I'm telling this story for you, Leslie Silco, but also for my my five grandchildren and my three children. So give them something that they can sink their teeth into in my storytelling. So fierce high school rivalry. I think it's interesting, the logos of the schools in recent time, and there was kind of this um, protesting by the Yakima tribes in Washington State that the logo on the left portrayed a Native American 
but not in a way that was any of the tribes in the area. And it was kind of an appropriation, you know, how a lot of sports teams use uh, the names of Indians or the different kinds of Redskins, etc. I think is one of the names of a sports team. I hope not anymore, but anyway, they got them to take off the indigenous person there or the simulation of it. And then on the right, you see now it says warriors, but it still has the two feathers and it has a W for warriors. So I know this is a theme in your book and in a lot of your books. And uh, so I just want to kick that in for you to let you know uh, that we have something, some things we're far apart, but we have some things in common. I want to, I want to look at that bird, and this is the hackberry tree as it looks now in the winter time. I go to that pond. Uh, you talk about ponds in your book. You talk about arroyos. This is an ephemeral pond, and a hackberry tree is on it. I want to read to you, sing to you a little song while Grace Ann does drumming. And uh, we'll show Grace Ann and I in the picture. And uh, that'll be fun, I hope, for my grandchildren, my children, and you. The earth is your mother. She holds you. The sky is your father. He protects you. Sleep. Sleep. Rainbow is your sister. She loves you. The winds are your brothers. They sing to you, sleep, sleep. We are together always. We are together always. There was never a time when this was not so. That's page 51 from your book, The Storyteller. Now this next part is about what you write about in nature and what I write about and experience in nature and try to do in what's called living storytelling. Stories that have a time and a place and a mind in nature, which Grace Ann and I picked up this idea from Kaylin Two Trees at a conference in 1996 and have stayed with it, stayed true to it ever since. I call this test tribute to you, a spiraling dragonfly song. Because only once did I see spiraling dragonflies. Never again, never again, never again. Only once did I see them. Only once did I see them. And never again. And and I want to introduce you to two of my friends here that are about half a mile from my house, maybe a mile. On the left is Grandmother Hackberry Tree. I call her that. And she has a little bench in front of her, a little fallen tree. And I sit on there, I meditate, and I play the drum. And on the right is Grandfather Hackberry Tree, and he's on the berm of a stock pond nearer to our house. And this stock pond is an ephemeral pond, and it's only got water in it a month or so of the year. And that's shifting which month it is from time to time. And I think you... Leslie Silco understand that uh, idea. And only once did I ever see spiraling dragonflies. Never, 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 never again, never again. And there must have been 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 of them. And they were spiraling up and they were spiraling down in one part of the pond not far from Grandfather Hackberry Tree. And there were probably mosquito larvae, other things concentrated in the water there. And they would go up and down, up and down, spiral, a perfect spiral. You, you should have seen it. And while that spiral continued to happen, pairs of lovers would go off elsewhere in the pond and mate for a while and then come back. So you had the spiraling up and down and feeding and then going off to mate and coming back. And only once did I see spiraling dragonflies. Never again, never again, never again. 
and there's a rainbow when you talk about the rainbow in your in your poetry you know and how the rainbow is there for you and you said it you said it in your book you know excuse me reordering your book but you said rainbow is our sister she loves you the earth is our mother she holds you the winds are our brothers they sing to you and me the sky is our father he protects us both i follow where rainbow sister leads and it's sometimes back to the hackberry tree and it has an arroyo and you talk about an arroyo we call it arroyo seco which in spanish means the dry arroyo when it's dry most of the year but once in a while it fills this ephemeral pond and i think about my ancestors when i'm there how Percy and Wilda lived common law from about 1927 until they did get married in 1953 living in the Yakima Valley they picked fruit they picked vegetables and Grace Ann and I study that how uh, modern day slaves are treated and here two white people or one white one possibly indigenous we don't know for sure No dragon flies today. No dragon flies today. So each day I go to the the same spot and look at the pond to see maybe dragon flies today. Maybe dragon flies spiraling. Never again. Never again. Never again. I dread seeing the pollution in the pond. I'm in the shadow at left taking the picture. And sometimes I go and I pick up the the trash in the pond. And one day I picked up this trash and the beer bottles in the cans of soda and beer. Ah. The logs left for the next fire and my pickup truck caught fire. And my wife Grace Ann said next to me said never again never again <laughs> never again <laughs> will you take our pickup truck to let it catch fire but i i still haul out trash and did so for many years that we've lived here to try to keep the pond nice and there's my dog sparkles and the other dog is um called cuddle bear and you can't see him in the pictures cuz he's always running around and he won't sit still to be fed or to be anything but to be running around by the pond. So here is Grandfather Hackberry. Now I'm sitting under it and I'm looking out at the pond, but the conditions are not right. There's no sign of dragonflies. Only once did I see spiraling dragonflies. Never again. Never again. Never again. We look to other creatures some of them skim across the water and i really like these spadefoot toads you and i Leslie Silco are from New Mexico and we know that the spadefoot toad is the national symbol of the aquatic life of New Mexico and this day i'm waiting to see the dragon flies the conditions are not right and i notice the playfulness of the polywogs and i noticed one in particular is is a carnivore he's a meat eater he eats other polywogs and the parents decide are they going to have an omnivore veggie eating polywog or are they going to have a carnivore and if the conditions are or bad at the pond i notice that there's more carnivores i'm sitting again at the pond and only once that I see spiraling dragonflies and never again and never again and never again but I go hopefully to the pond and here you see the hackberries green ripening not ready to fall another season of the year and the pond full and there's grandfather hackberry tree across the pond 
and I'm looking for any dragonfly, any dragonfly that I see. Another walk to the pond, of course. Conditions perfect, but only once did I see spiraling dragonflies. Never again, never again, never again. But I walk back there anyway. Now here's a spadefoot toad I was telling you about, the symbol of aquatic life for the state of New Mexico. And it makes me wonder if politicians actually know who this is, the spadefoot toad. I mean, they dig down into the sand and once a year they come up about 18 inches of digging and they, they become polywogs and then they become these marvelous creatures with two legs. And here I pick up one and I hold him in my palm of my hand, gently, gently, gently. He, she, I scoop he, she up, I don't know. Waiting for the dragonfly spiral to return. Now it's morning in Las Cruces. Wonderful sunsets. Leslie Silka, you see these same sunrises and sunsets. This is sunrise. And I'm drumming here with my wife, Grace Ann, and uh, call her Wonder Woman, taking good care of me during my stage four cancer. I'm a survivor. And she's written this wonderful book called Tribal Wisdom. And I'm wondering if she would might just say something about it. The Tribal Wisdom book is my attempt to allow indigenous Native Americans, especially in the Southwest area here, to speak in their own voices in a book designed for students of the business college or anywhere interested in the ethical perspectives of Native Americans. So the chapters are written by friends of ours. Um, and we non-Native people have written some of them. Half are written by Indigenous scholars. And we each offer our interpretations of what we've learned, what we hear and study with Native Indigenous scholars, and how we can relate that not only to the Indigenous lifestyle, but to contemporary lifestyles today for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. This is Don Papillon professor at New Mexico State University, and he wrote a chapter on indigenous ways of knowing, and he usually kicks off our conference each December. And it's been in Las Cruces for a, how long, Grace Ann? 12 years? The conference has been 12 years now. Next December, we might go to another country. We'll see. And if you like this video series, please hit the like button. Don't try to do it now. This is a <laughs> just to show you that there is a like button. And go ahead and subscribe. We appreciate it if you subscribe and then more people will get to know what we're doing. And we appreciate that. Here is uh, Professor Gregory Cajete from the University of New Mexico up north where you live, Leslie Silco, and you, you may know him. Uh, you may not, but he's a wonderful leader, and uh, he also comes to our conference most years and gives a keynote whenever he's there. And that's me. I've got chapters in Grace Ann Rosil's book as well, and so does Gregory Cajete. And Grace Ann, back to you. On the left, we see Jay Francis, a wonderful woman who works with the tribal students at the University of New Mexico, north of us in Albuquerque. And she and her students came and visited us and uh, 
shared with us their perspective on tribal wisdom and ethics in a tribal tradition. We have, we used some footage for uh, films on tribal wisdom for business ethics, and there's a series of one, about 30 minute film, 20 or 30 minutes, and four short films, each looking at a perspective of indigenous wisdom and tribal wisdom from an ethical perspective and applying it to areas of concern for people commercially in the business world and just life in general. If you see this waving tail in the background, it's our dog Sparkles who's drumming on the green screen behind us. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can hear it, but he's got pretty good, pretty good rhythm. Uh, appreciate him. Her. her. Appreciate her. And Cuddlebear. This is uh, uh, the Las Cruces Dam. And if you follow the Arroyo, the Alameda Arroyo down there, you can get some sense of what it was like 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and the little parts of it. And here at the dam, the uh, youngsters from high school and from uh, college will go and uh, put their graffiti and have their beer and their, leave their stuff. And Sparkles and I, whose tail is <laughs> wagging a lot here, will go there. So some of the takeaways today. Uh, first of all, the, for the non-Indigenous crowd out there, it's not something you give takeaways to when you're giving living stories. Uh, you don't fill in the blanks. You don't explain the plot. You don't give a moral of the story. And I'm hoping Grace Ann will, will uh, jump in here at some point. And so we don't want to give a moral to the story, even though uh, sort of the uh, Anglo crowd may expect that, or the European crowd, that is, too. Um, because that's not the way it do it's done. The community raises the storytellers in uh, indigenous ways of knowing. In uh, Grace Ann's book and our work together um, for, what, 23 years now, Grace Ann? We work together. And uh, I don't think you connect the dots in your book either. And I don't think I want to connect my dots. So the takeaways are you're going to have to figure out the morals yourself. I invite you to uh, join us at inthinkment.com any Tuesday about 1 o'clock. We're on Zoom. And uh, you just go to my website, davidboji.com, and, and I'll get you a Zoom link. Anybody's welcome. It's welcome to all. And uh, we talk about storytelling in the indigenous ways of knowing and in the Western ways of knowing and those... Uh, colonial, exploitive, oppressive ways of knowing and doing storytelling and sometimes in the corporate world, maybe oftentimes. Uh, so there's a little video to give you an introduction to the Enthinkment Circle people. You see them in the picture. And uh, again, give us a like, give us a subscription, and I'll put these links to some of the videos that we mentioned and some of the PDFs in the description to the video. And we thank you for joining us here today. And we really appreciate you uh, for tuning in. At least I do, Grace Ann. appreciate you for drumming. And I thank you for that. Appreciate uh, Sparkles here for wagging his tail, if you can see it down on the bottom here. Because uh, Living Stories is about animal stories and water stories and all kinds of pollywogs and spadefoots and all kinds of stories, okay? Birds. Yeah, you like birds. All right. <laughs> so thanks again and tune in next time. Bye now.